right, welcome in, welcome in this morning. If you would, come in and find your seat. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning and choosing to worship with us. Uh, we are very blessed just to have a great community uh, from Chini here this morning. Uh, so if you would, stand with us as we worship together.
this be my confession my wealth is in the
are living and we are able to worship the God who is living. And I was reminded as we prayed as a team before service this morning, uh, just how big of a God we serve, regardless of how big the things are that we are going through in life, which is such a simple message, but can feel like an impossible thing for us to believe sometimes. So I just pray that that would ring true for us in our lives today and that we would be able to believe that or at least ask that we could believe that even if we don't believe that we really can or know how. And I thank you that that is outside of us, that that is not dependent on us and we don't need fancy words or anything for that to be true, Lord, that that is always and forever true. And I also just want to thank you for um, everyone who stepped out in obedience and boldness this morning to serve you, Lord, and makes this uh, Sunday service happen, that makes this church operate from the worship team to uh, the people just making coffee and putting out donuts, um, as well as Shane. Thank you that he stepped out in obedience and boldness and is willing to speak to us this morning and just share your word and share what is on his heart. Uh, we thank you and praise you for that, Lord. In your name we pray. All right, so at this time, we are going to dismiss our kids to their services uh, so they can go straight out those back doors to Faith Kids. Um, and then the rest of us, I know it's early. I'm not usually one to talk to people before 9 a.m., but uh, I'm going to invite you to uh, turn to someone and say hello. Ask them maybe if they're lucky enough to have air conditioning. All right, if you would, please find your seat. I have a few announcements for you before we get started. Uh, first of all, you are at Cheney Faith Center this morning, so thank you for joining us. Our goal here at Cheney Faith Center is just to help people know Jesus and live for him daily. Um, so it's a simple goal, but it takes a lot to get done, as you can see, um, by all the amazing people who volunteer to just run our various teams. Um, and another way we accomplish that is through your giving. So there's lots of ways to give. You can give online on our website or also in person at our offering box in the back. Um, and that offering goes to all of our programs here, so it helps us run um, Faith Kids and hospitality and our youth stuff. Um, and a great example of that is a couple weeks ago now, I don't know. You camp tired me out so much I can't keep track of time anymore. We went to camp and that is only possible through your giving um, and your scholarships to students. We were able to send students to camp that otherwise wouldn't be able to. So we're super grateful for that. And we saw a lot of really cool stories coming out of camp. Um, we even had students who I don't think that they knew that they were coming to church camp. They just got invited. Um, and then they, at the end of the week, they decide to give their life to Jesus. And it was such an amazing thing to see. Um, and that is just possible through, obviously, the Lord's provisions and your guys' giving and um, volunteering as well. So thank you for that. Uh, we are also continuing our little series um, called Peas on the Patio. We tried to get Mark not to name it that, and he refused. So now I have to say it up on stage in a microphone. Peas on the Patio. So if you want, uh, after service, they are going to be serving popcorn out in the patio so you can grab a snack um, and just fellowship with one another and just build community right here in our community. Um, and with that, I'm going to invite Shane up on stage. He is going to be speaking with us this morning. So can we welcome Shane? Thank you. Good morning. Let's slide this over on that side a little bit. All right. It's good to be with you this morning. Excited to share God's word together. Uh, this is always an amazing opportunity uh, just to get to open up and learn together. Uh, I had this image come to mind as I was preparing the message for, for this week of, of going on a hike. And I don't know if you are, are a hiker, if you enjoy outdoors and, and going on different excursions, but so, sometimes you're with different people. You know, at, at one time you might be with like almost like a professional guide or someone who at least has hiked that area countless times and they know it like the back of their hand and they're kind of guiding you along the way and, and they're the expert, right? And there's other times where you're just kind of out 
walking with some friends, leisurely, taking your time. Maybe you stop for a, a snack or a water break and one friend kind of pokes around the corner to see what's coming up on the trail next and then comes back and kind of tells you about it. I feel like today we're in that latter example. I uh, do not consider myself to be the expert when it comes to looking to God's word, what he has for us, what he wants to grow us in. We're on a journey together. And I'm excited that the Holy Spirit is our guide and he will lead us and direct us into what he wants every single one of us to, to hear and to walk away with today. And hopefully it's not just to hear and, and good things to consider, but hopefully it's a, something that gets rooted deep in our hearts mine included, and God does a work in us that might begin today, but then continue throughout the rest of our week and hopefully the rest of our lives. So would you pray with me as we go to God's word together this morning? Jesus, you are so faithful. God, even when we are not, you are faithful because it is your character. God, you are constant. You don't change. It gives us peace and and hope in whatever circumstance we find ourselves in. God, I want to thank you for uh, the leadership and the blessing of pastors Mark and Kate. I pray that you would bless them as they are uh, resting and being refreshed with family. Uh, God, would you continue to anoint them for, for the work of, of leading and serving the rest of us. God, I also ask uh, that you would uh, just speak very clearly God, that you would help me to say nothing more, nothing less than what you would have for us today. God, I'm just available uh, to be used by you, God. And would these moments together, these words, be yours. We ask in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right, so throughout this summer, we are going on a journey together through uh, the book of Ephesians. And we're, we're hitting kind of the midway point here. We're looking at just the last two verses uh, Ephesians chapter 3. So if you have your Bible or Bible app, if you want to get there, we'll also have the text along the screen to follow along with. Um, and today we're talking about the power of God within us, which I just hear that and already I'm intimidated. Like, what does that mean? The power of God within us. While we're only looking at two verses, uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of context. Um, actually, this is kind of a culmination of the entire first three chapters of Ephesians 3 wrapping up here. And while we're not going to read all of the first three chapters together, I do want to read the preceding verses that Pastor Kate preached on last week just to understand where we pick up the conversation. So I'm actually going to start a little bit earlier. I apologize. This will, this will not be on the screen. But I want to pick it up in, in verse 14 of chapter 3. Paul says this, he says, when I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. And then here's where we pick up today, verse 20. Now all glory to God, who is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. So in this verse, we see one, that God is able. It's not talking about our abilities. God is able. It's his power power at work, his mighty power at work within us. And it's his power that's at work in us as his people right now. This is not like a future, hey, when we get to heaven, then we'll get to experience this incredible power of God. No, it says, no, right now, God's power is at work in those of us who believe. Well, I immediately go to the question, like, what, what does that mean? What, what is this power of God? It's pretty cool because as I was looking and researching, the, the Greek word for power is dynamis. That sounds 
familiar? I mean, pretty close to dynamite. I mean, you think about that explosive nature of energy and power that's within a firework, right? That's the power of God. Just, I mean, just a small fraction of, of a comparison to the, the power of God at work within us, his people. And earlier in Ephesians, Paul, Paul talks about what this power is and, and, and where it comes from and how it works within us. So I want to read Ephesians 1, verse 19 and 23. Where he prays earlier, he says, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ, who fills everything, all things everywhere with himself. It says this is the incredible greatness of God's power. Think about this. The exact same power that raised Jesus from the dead. That's the power that we're talking about here. N not, not a junior varsity version of that power. Like the same power that raised Christ from the dead is, is within us and accessible to those of us who believe for God's people. And it's accomplished through the cross. See, I, I think sometimes we have not a wrong but maybe uh, an incomplete view of what exactly happened on the cross. See, for those of us, for the most part, in kind of the, the Western world, the Western church, we see the cross in terms of uh, judicial uh, experience or judicial power, which it is that, meaning that every single one of us was guilty in our, our sin and our selfishness, our, our rebellion from God. Jesus was perfect in his perfection and gives his life freely on the cross, taking on our guilt, taking on our shame, and in turn giving us his perfections so that we can stand right before God. That is 100% true. However, the, the cross did something more. It's also a display of God's power absolute power over every other form of power, whether that be worldly power, whether that be like demonic power, whether that be just the power of our own selfishness and sin inside of us, the power of death. And if you were to talk to a brother or sister in Christ, maybe in Africa or in the underground church in China, they would talk about the power of God when they talk about the cross. And I think sometimes we, we miss that piece of it here in kind of the Western world. But that's where the power of God is displayed and that's the same power of God at work within us who believe. And it says that, that we are the body of Christ. It doesn't say that we're like the body of Christ. It's that we are, the church is the body of Christ. His presence to continue his work by his power. That, that's, that's what he does. He chooses to work in us and through us. So when we talk about this word called the, the incarnation, which is which God coming down, putting on flesh to walk among us. However, the incarnation was not a historical event that lasted 33 years when Jesus was physically present in his physical body on this earth. It was that, but the incarnation now continues through us, through his people. Here's the way that one author describes it. It says, the incredible graciousness power and mercy that came into our world in Jesus is still, at least potentially so, in our world in us, the body of Christ. What Jesus did, we too can do. In fact, that is precisely what we are asked to do. So this is the power of God at work. So how does God empower us? Well, again, we look in Ephesians, it says in verse 16 of chapter 3 that we just read, where Paul says, I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, Pastor Kate talked about this last week, he will empower you with inner strength, inner strength through his spirit. So we are empowered with inner strength. God's resources are unlimited for you and for everyone else who believes in him. 
And we're empowered by his spirit inside of us. And then in verse 18, it says, may you have the power to understand as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high and how deep his love is. God's power is for us to understand God's love. As you experience more and more of God's love in your life personally, you will come to understand and see and experience more and more of God's power. God's power is never separated from God's love. And then in verse 7, earlier in Ephesians 3, it says, By God's grace and mighty power, I have been given the privilege of serving him by spreading this good news. So God's power empowers us to serve him not just for our own desires, our own efforts, our own goals, but empowers us to serve God in our lives. And then one more passage. This is another letter that Paul writes while he's in prison, similar to this letter to the book, or to, to the church in Ephesus. He writes to Timothy and he says this, for God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. So never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord and don't be ashamed of me either, even though I'm in prison for him. With the strength God gives you, be ready to suffer with me for the sake of the good news. So God's power does not protect us from suffering, doesn't prevent suffering or hardship in our lives, but God's power will help us to endure through seasons of suffering and hardship. Sometimes I think when we're in a tough moment of life or a tough circumstance, we think, well, surely th this isn't from God. God wouldn't do this, right? God wouldn't cause this, right? Well, I think if you look at almost anyone in scripture that God did an incredible work through, there were some hard seasons, some tough moments, but God's power will help us to endure through those seasons of hardship. And I love when it says that by God's power, we can accomplish infinitely more. Another translation says excessively beyond. And he, here's the way that Charles Spurgeon speaks when he's talking about Paul's language here. He says, he has constructed here in the Greek an expression which is altogether his own. No language was powerful enough for the apostle. Well, I mean, for the Holy Ghost speaking through the apostle. For very often, Paul has to coin words and phrases to shadow forth his meaning. And here is one. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly, so abundantly that it exceeds measure and description. How do you describe something that's indescribable? How do you measure something that's unquantifiable? I think the only way to really describe or, or to try to get that across to someone else so they understand what you're, you're trying to help them to see and, and, and to grasp is, is through experience. It's like, I can't fully put language to it. You have to just come and see. That's why scripture says, taste and see that the Lord is good because it's through experience, not just knowledge that we come to know God, understand his love and then experience his power through us. It reminds me years ago, I, so I, I grew up in Alaska, born and raised, and I went um, to school down in Orange County, Southern California. Total culture shock, like different worlds. And after my, my freshman year, uh, I was driving back home, uh, road tripping back to Alaska, and I had uh, two, two of my buddies I had just met that year at, at, at school had never been outside of Southern California. And they, I invited them to come with me. I said, hey, why don't you come? Like, we'll road trip together. It's going to take us a week or so to get back up there and, you know, come stay for a month. You know, college students, you don't have jobs yet. So it's like, hey, let's enjoy this time. It was so fun. Like, almost experiencing those things for the first time again through their eyes. So we're driving through British Columbia and Upper Yukon. And, man, it seems like around every other corner you're seeing either a big bull moose or grizzly bear, black bear. I remember there's one time there's this black bear just right on the side of the road foraging for berries or something. And so we, we, we slow down. We're, you know, in the middle of nowhere. No one's around. So we, and we just start like just kind of crawling like we're still in our car, but like crawling along the side of the road here. And my friend Dave, who just kind of classic picture like Southern California surfer, like that was his hair, all like the way he talked, like just him epitomized, all right? And he's like hanging out the window, like calling the bear. I'm like, Dave, get in the car. What are you doing? Like those things will kill you. 
But it was so, like, there was just no way for me. I had shown them pictures and told them stories about, you know, fishing and camping and hiking. But they, until they actually saw it, there was just no way for them to fully grasp. And that's what it's like when it comes to experiencing God's love. And I think Paul is trying to find that language of, like, it's just, it's so good. His power excessively beyond. It's so much more than you can ask, think, imagine, or dream. It's that big. It reminds me of, our, our kids, I have, I have three kids, six, eight, and 10 years old. Kids are amazing dreamers, aren't they? Like they don't need to be taught to dream big or to think about the impossible or have these huge lofty goals. I, I think actually the opposite is true, right? As we kind of grow and mature a little bit more, we, 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 we learn to kind of like, well, let's, let's bring that goal down a little bit. Let's, let's dream a little bit more realistic here, right? And I wonder when Jesus tells us, hey, to become like little children, to inherit his kingdom, I wonder if a piece of that is that we would keep dreaming a little bit bigger and not become such realists in our maturity as we grow and believe that God wants to do infinitely more than we can ask, think, or imagine. So I think I need us to pause for, for just a moment as I was preparing this, I realized this word power, there's a lot of different types of power, a lot of forms of power, and not all of it is good. Not all of it is from God. And so I, I just need to pause real quick and talk about there's some cautions in our lives when it comes to power, to making sure that we're not grasping the wrong form of power, thinking that it's God's power, okay? One, I think a caution I've seen a lot is that we can deny or dismiss God's power. We do this when we think we know everything in our own wisdom. And we're smart enough, you know, we're, we're educated now, and so oh, we, we, we can see there's other explanations now for the supernatural. It's like we, we almost feel like we grow past that. Again, I think that's a, that's a caution for all of us. Later on in the letter to Timothy, Paul talks about people who have a, a form of godliness, but deny its power. He says, be careful of people like that. That we have this, this form of, of, of power in our lives, or we have this form of influence, but we don't actually acknowledge the one who gave us the gifts and the wisdom and the abilities, and we don't give the glory back to him. We keep it for ourselves. We have to be careful. The other, I think, is we can just seek the wrong types of power, what I would call worldly power. And the challenge is that's often easier and a quicker grab to get things like authority through our influence, through money, through a title, through position in a workplace, and we kind of grasp toward these things because they're easier to measure and to quantify. I want to I read a quote uh, from one of my favorite books called In the Name of Jesus by Henry Nouwen. He says this, one of the greatest ironies of the history of Christianity is that its leaders constantly gave in to the temptation of power. Political power, military power, economic power, or moral and spiritual power. Even though they continued to speak in the name of Jesus, who did not cling to his divine power, but emptied himself and became as we are. The temptation to consider power an apt instrument for the proclamation of the gospel is the greatest of all. What makes the temptation of power seemingly irresistible, he asks. Maybe it is that power offers an easy substitute for the hard task of love. It seems easier to be God than to love God. Easier to control people than to love people. Easier to own life than to love life. Jesus asks, do you love me? We ask, can we sit at your right hand and your left hand in your kingdom? Ever since the snake said, the day you eat of this tree, your eyes will be open and you will be like gods, knowing good from evil. We have been tempted to replace love with power. God's power is never separated from God's love. And you just think about the context of where we find these, these two verses at the end of Ephesians chapter 3. It's right after 
Paul has prayed that we would grow in our understanding of the depth and the breadth and the height and the width of God's love. Like that's where then he, then he goes in and talking about this incredible power. It's never separated from God's love. Another caution I see is that we can seek the right power, God's power, but we seek it for the wrong reasons. I think a, a great example of this is a man named Simon. Acts chapter 8, it's when the gospel first goes to this region called Samaria. This man, Philip, goes and he preaches and all these people start to believe in Jesus. And then Peter and John, two of the apostles, they, they come and they, they start praying for people and, and laying hands on people and people are receiving the Holy Spirit as they believed in Jesus. And there's this man named Simon. He was a sorcerer, a magician. And in prior to any of this happening, he actually had a, a reputation a stage name, if you will. He was known as the power of God in that region for the, the magic, the sorcery that he could do. Well, Simon actually put his faith in Jesus. He, he, he was baptized when he, when he heard the message of the gospel. But then when he saw Peter and John come and they started to lay hands and, and pray for people, he, he saw the Holy Spirit fall on people. And he's like, I want that. I want to do what you just did. And so he offers them money. He says, how much money is it going to take for me to buy that power? Because that's a different type of power than what I've experienced in my life. And, and Peter rebukes him. He says, no, no, no. How, how dare you think that the gift of God, the power of God could be bought? And he exposes his heart. He says, you're full of bitter jealousy. Like you're not the main guy anymore. You're not the most popular one. And so the question I think is, okay, is it about God's glory or is it about mine? Are, are, are people seeing God in a new fashion or are they, are they drawn to me? See, if people are more impressed by me than they are by God, then I'm, I'm probably missing it. Or if I'm angry that people aren't responding or living the way that I want them to live, I might be missing it. Because it's God's power, and he's also in control of the results and the outcomes. We don't get to decide that, right? So we say, okay, God, I want your power, your work to flow through me, and I trust you with the outcomes. Whatever happens, whether I get to see the immediate results or not, I trust that you are working and that you are good. Okay, so there's some cautions with power. Now we can get back into hopefully the more motivating part of the conversation. So how do we practically live in or walk in the power of God? We talk about what it is, how God empowers us, some, some areas to kind of just be, be careful of in our lives, some temptations to watch for. Well, how do we practically walk in, live this out in our lives? One, it starts with love. Experiencing the love of Christ personally. It's always where God's work, God's power starts, is with his love. Let me read verse 19 again, where Paul prays, May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. We experience God's power when we experience his love. And his love is the way he transforms us and the way he transforms the world around us. See, as we grow in experiencing God's love, we will grow in the ability to express God's love. See, I believe when, when Paul is saying, would you grow in understanding God's love? Would you grow in experiencing his love? I believe he's not just saying for you and I, like, like not just that we would receive and just kind of hold it all up for ourselves. He says, no, would you understand it more? Because when you understand it more for you personally, it's going to flow out of you more. When, when you experience it more in your life personally, the love of God, it's going to flow out of you. See, Jesus says that anyone who would come to him and believe would have streams of living water flowing in them and through them. See, we, see we're not meant to be this one way in source, like this, this pond that just accumulates and grows and grows and the water expands. No, we're, we're meant to be this, this river where, where God's love and his power flows in us so that it can flow through us. See, the second it stops flowing out of you, that's when the water gets kind of yucky, right? That's when it starts to smell 
kind of funny and the, 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 the seaweed growing along the, the, the edges, like no one wants to swim there. We went to a lake yesterday and we were trying to swim and it was like the six inches of the bottom was just like muck, like, like none of my kids wanted to step in it, right? Like that's, we become kind of mucky when God's love starts, stops flowing out of us. It's got to come in and go out. It's this living stream. So we experience it personally. Also, walking in the power of God requires confidence and humility. It's the same coin, two different sides. It's confidence in God, who God is, what he's done, what he's promised, and trusting that he will equip you by his power for every work that he sets before you. Second Peter 1 verse 3 and 4 says, by his divine power, God has given us everything, everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him. The one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. Confidence in who God is, what he's equipped you with, and confidence in his faithful promises. And it's also humility. And again, it's humility found in God. He's doing the work, not us. We're accomplishing his work, not, not our own agenda. And it's glory to him, not glory to us. And the gifts, the abilities, the talents, the wisdom, whatever you have that God's given you, it's God that's given it to you. Right? Even, even the ability to, to go and be educated, right? To, to learn, that's all from God. The ability to go to your job tomorrow and to, to earn an income to, to provide for you and for your family, that's all from God. Every gift we have is a gift from God. So it's confidence in who God is, and it's also humility, recognizing it comes from him and not from us. The other consistent theme all throughout scripture that we have to talk about when we talk about the power of God is we have to talk about prayer, fasting, and intimacy with God. Those are consistently connected to the power of God all throughout scripture. I think about just intimacy with God, growing close with God in, in the moments that hardly anyone ever sees or knows about, that private, quiet relationship with God. I mean, we see this in the life of Moses, where before he showed up and, and kind of had this interactions with Pharaoh and before we see the, the plagues come along Egypt and God, you know, delivering his people, we sometimes forget that Moses was 40 years in the wilderness with God. And, and that gets a little blurb mentioned in scripture, but I imagine there was incredible faith and richness and intimacy cultivated in those quiet moments, those quiet years before Moses was ever on the scene in Egypt. We see this in the life of David, known as a man after God's own heart, the greatest king in Israel. He was a shepherd for years. Watching sheep, I, I've never done that. I imagine it's kind of a lonely job. I mean, you're out there with animals. He says that he had to protect against predators. So he has to kind of keep alert, but a lot of time, just him and God, just building that relationship, building that trust. And then of course, we see this in the life of Jesus who really, the first 30 years of his life, we see a, a, a very drawn out and extended account of his birth a couple different times. We see one interaction when he's about 12 years old of him at the temple with his family. But aside from that, we don't really see a whole lot in the first 30 years of his earthly life. And even when he does begin his public ministry, the first 40 days, he's out praying and fasting with God. And then as we talk about prayer and fasting, this quote from Andrew Murray is a beautiful picture. It says, prayer is the one hand with which we grasp the invisible, fasting the other 
with which we let loose and cast away the visible. Prayer needs fasting for its full and perfect development. Now, if I can just be completely transparent and honest with you, this is hard for me. As I was researching and preparing and writing this message, I realized, man, I, I've not had a consistent rhythm of fasting in the, probably the last five or six months. And I was reminded of, yeah, that's, that's hard, but there's some deep work that God does there. And, and a lot of times I don't even recognize the deep work that he's doing. It's not like all of a sudden you, you know, end if you're fasting for one day or maybe for a couple days, maybe just one meal. It's not an immediate gratification. All of a sudden you go, oh, wow, God did this. He can, and sometimes he does do that. He reveals something new. But I think it's one of those, again, where it's over time. It's, it's drawn out to where all of a sudden we become people who are experiencing God's love and learning to love in the same way more and more. We become more gentle, kind, patient, and forgiving, not just in one solitary moment, but throughout a lifetime of following Jesus and surrendering more and more to him. We see prayer and fasting powerfully in the lives of Esther, Daniel in the Old Testament, of course, in the life of Jesus, and then early Christians for centuries. It was a normal practice that they would, they would fast for one or two days a week. And I actually learned recently that oftentimes they chose Wednesday and Friday as the days that they fasted. And I was like, oh, that's interesting, just random days during the week. But no, they weren't random. See, when you look at the kind of the, the Holy Week, the, the week leading up to the cross and the resurrection, if you've ever gone through that before, there's kind of different significant moments that happen historically in the days leading up to Jesus' death and resurrection. Wednesday is the day that he was betrayed by one of his closest friends, Judas, walks into the garden where he's praying with a contingent of Roman soldiers and palace guards. He was betrayed on Wednesday. And of course, Friday is the day that he is condemned and crucified. So for centuries, followers of Jesus would set aside those two days to, to give up something like food. Say, Jesus, we want to we connect with you and recognize the betrayal and the suffering that you experienced. And we want to know you more, experience more of your love, more of your spirit, more of your power working in us and through us. The other thing about prayer is, is prayer is not passive. Here's a quote from Ronald Rollheiser. He says, when we pray through Christ, more is involved than merely asking God in heaven to make some kind of intervention. So we're not just asking God to do something and just sitting back and watching. We're not observers. He says the community too, and, and we ourselves must be involved, not just in the petition, but also in trying to bring about what the petition pleads for. This means when we pray for each other, we know that someone is, is sick. We pray for healing. Maybe we also bring a meal. We, we, we know that someone is, is hurting in their marriage. We pray for their marriage. We also invite them over for dinner, right? We, we pray and then we ask, God, would you do a work? And if at all possible, God, would you allow me the blessing of being part of your miraculous answer to this prayer? Not that it's me, God, it's all you, but would you allow me to be a part of that if that is possible, if that is your will? Think about a, a story in my life uh, years ago. So I was 17 years old um, when I came to know Jesus. And it was a, a drastic change in my life. I did not grow up in the church, did not grow up following God. Um, God broke some incredible chains of addiction loose in, in my life in those first few months. And that was a story in, in, in my family of, of, of addiction um, for a lot of years. And I actually had an immediate family member who uh, was still very much in, in the throes of that. And, and she saw the change in, in, in my life and, and, and she was still 
uh, battling her own narcotic addiction. And I remember for about a week, uh, I had talked with her about what God was doing in my life, the, the incredible joy and, and freedom. And it was like that first like two months of walking with Jesus, like I honestly felt like there was more life that I had lived in those first two months than the prior 17 years. And I, I think she started to see a difference. And so I share with her, like, this is what God's doing. Like, I feel this weight lifted, like walking with Jesus is so good. And she had spent countless hours, thousands of dollars in all different rehab, inpatient, outpatient, for probably a decade before that, and nothing had stuck. And then she said, you know, I'm, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try this. I remember for about a week straight, she went through violent withdrawals on the couch in our living room. You know, if you've ever seen or experienced that, just the, the sweats, the cold shakes, your body violently, as this poison is being drawn out, but it's been dependent on it for so long. And I would walk, I was still going to school, and I'd, I'd walk by, and I'd lay my hands on her, and I'd pray for her, and, you know, where I could, I'd you know, refill water and bring chicken broth and, you know, couldn't really keep anything down, but I just, just prayed so desperately that God would break these chains, finally. And he did. And she's been walking with Jesus for almost 20 years now. And it was incredible to see the power of God. And I know it wasn't me, but just to be like, okay, I know God's doing the real work in her heart, but if I can just be a tangible reminder that she is not alone in this moment, and if my hand on her shoulder or a cold drink of water can just be a reminder that God loves her and he sees her, then maybe this time will be different. The challenge is for me, and I'm, I'm sure for several of you, there's other family members that I know that unfortunately that, that hasn't happened for yet. And I'm still praying that God would break those chains loose in their life the same way they did in her life. The other thing to recognize is that the power of God takes on many different forms or expressions in our lives. You know, when you think about the, the waters of the Red Sea parting, or Elijah calling fire down from heaven. Okay, that's pretty obvious. Power of God's at work. Those, those are the exceptions, right? Those are the rarities. I think we see the, the power of God anytime we see healing around us, whether that healing be spiritual healing, physical, mental, emotional. When you, when you experience that personally, you see that that is the power of God at work. Reconciled relationships, Relationships that were strained, that, that were far from each other because some riff happened years ago, sometimes generationally going back for years and, and all of a sudden there's reconciliation. That is the power of God at work. That's what Paul's talking about earlier in, in the second half of Ephesians chapter two where he talks about the Jews and the Gentiles and that God has broken down this dividing wall of hostility. The, the, the people that you feel like are the farthest apart from you, whether it be politically, wh whether it be because of what happened in your family years ago, like when God brings people together that should not be together at the same table, that is the power of God. And that is one of the most powerful pictures to the world around us, that Jesus is who he says he is, and he's doing work in our lives that no one else can explain. Restored marriages, marriages that either were on the brink of divorce or maybe they went so far as divorce, but then God brings people back together. He, he says, no, there's, there's still life here. There's, there's still more to be done in this relationship. We see those who are far from God finding a home 
in a family through Jesus and the people of God, his church. That is the power of God at work. And then we see the Holy Spirit changing us to live and love more like Jesus. That is the power of God in our lives. See, here's, here's what's normal in our world. is to take whatever we've received and to give back in kind. So if I receive love, I'm going to give love back. If I receive kindness and generosity, I'm going to give back kindness and generosity. If I receive ridicule, I'm going to give back ridicule. If I receive hate, I'm going to give back hate. That's normal in our world. Jesus says, not so with you. My people are different. My way is different. See, I don't love you because you've earned it or you deserve it or because you agree with me. I love you because it's within my nature to love. That's who I am. And my love is not earned. My love is not deserved. See, anything that we do not allow God to transform within us, we will transmit to others. Here's what I mean by that. When, when, when you receive ridicule, when you, when you have somebody who is combative with you at work, when you have a boss who is cutting you down, see, that, that doesn't go away within you. Those emotions stay there. They might not be in your conscious, but they're still there. And then they, they come out in a moment when maybe your, your kid does something little that upsets you, and all of a sudden you respond way over the top way louder than necessary. Whoa, where did that come from? It's because I didn't allow God to do this work to transform what had happened within me. See, when we receive hate, when we receive discord, when we receive condemnation, we have a choice. Am I going to give that back in kind to those around me, often to those who are closest to me, my spouse and my kids? Or am I going to say, God, this, this wasn't right. This wasn't justified. The way I was treated was not fair. We can acknowledge that. But God, would you do a deep work in my heart so I don't put that back out in my relationships, but I surrender that to you and you transform it and I can put back out love, forgiveness, mercy, grace, gentleness, maybe even toward the one who responded towards me with hate and discord and condemnation. Because the power of God is never separated from the love of God. Paul ends this section of Ephesians chapter 3. And this is kind of like the, the apex of a teeter totter of, of this entire book. So we're kind of at the apex. And then you'll see as we get into chapter 4 next week, we start to talk about some practical application within the church, within our marriages, within our relationship with our kids, even our workplaces. But he ends this section where he says, all glory to God, glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever, amen. I love this quote from David Guzik. He says, the only fitting response to this great God is to give him glory. These two verses, verse 20 and 21, were actually a, like a creed almost in the early church. Most early Christians would, would have had these two verses memorized. This would have been even a, a hymn that they would have sung. So we sang songs together of praise and worship to start our time together. This, this would have been a song that they sang. They proclaimed it together. So as we prepare to close our time. I'm going to ask, would you stand to your feet with me? I'm going to have these two verses on the screen. I just want to, I want us to read, a, read them out loud together. I'm not going to ask you to sing these verses, but just I'd love for us to read these out loud and worship to our God. So verse 20 and 21 of Ephesians 3. Would you read these with me? Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen.
We'll have prayer partners up front. If you'd like prayer about anything happening in your life or in the life of someone that you know. Uh, popcorn on the patio. Would you, grow, would you go today in the power, the love, and the grace of Jesus? God bless you.